Bonsoir, bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're ab absolutely thrilled to welcome you all tonight uh, for this discussion on the rise of political anti-Semitism in the United States. I'm Emmanuel Catan. I'm the director of the Alliance Program here at Columbia University. And before I introduce our speakers, uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, the Maison Française for hosting this event, its director, Shani Pierre, um, and uh, Fanny Gay, who helped organize this evening's event. I'd also like to thank the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies and its co-directors, Rebecca Cobran and Elisheva Kalbach, uh, the Department of History, as well as Columbia University Press, uh, its director, uh, Jennifer Crew and Larry Kritzman, uh, who published uh, Pierre Bienbaum's book, uh, Tears of History in English. In his book, Pierre Bienbaum um, surveys the history of anti-Semitism in this country and uh, develops the idea of American exceptionalism. The fact that contrary to Europe, the United States experienced little violence against Jews until the beginning of the 20th century in recent times and with the attack uh, on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, the situation changed drastically. To understand this evolution and uh, what the future may hold, we are delighted to welcome Pierre Bionbaum himself, uh, emeritus professor at uh, Paris en Panthéon Sorbonne, uh, whose book, uh, The Tears of History, was published by Columbia University Press uh, earlier uh, last year. We're thrilled to welcome Professor Ara Katznelson and Professor Rebecca Cobran, who will offer their insights into this book and its subject matter. So I'll, just to let you know how we're going to work tonight, I'll uh, briefly introduce our three speakers. Um, Professor Bionbaum will then uh, present the key arguments uh, in his book. And we'll then have uh, a response uh, from uh, Professor Cobran and Professor uh, Katznelson before opening it up to uh, you, to the, to the audience, for questions and answers. I should mention uh, that uh, there's a flyer outside uh, with a discount code for the purchase of uh, Tears of History. Um, and uh, thank you so much to Columbia University Press uh, please feel free to avail yourself of this opportunity. So, Professor uh, Bionbaum is a historian and a political sociologist, a professor emeritus at Paris 1. His books include Paths of Emancipation, Jews, States, and Citizenship, co-edited actually with uh, Ara Katznelson, The Anti-Semitic Moment, a tour of France in 1898, The Jews of the Republic, a political history of state Jews in France from Gambetta to the Republic, and geography of hope, exile, the Enlightenment, disassimilation. Ira Katznelson is Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia University and the Deputy Director of Columbia World Projects. His 2013 Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time was awarded the Bancroft Prize in History. Um, there's room at the front uh, and on this side if you want to uh, if you want to come. Uh, other books include uh, Southern Nation, Congress and White Supremacy After Reconstruction, and Liberal Beginnings: A Republic for the Moderns. His most recent book is Time Counts: Quantitative Methods for Historical Social Science, co-authored with Greg Warrow. And Rebecca Cobran is the uh, Russell and Bettina Knapp. Associate Professor of American Jewish History. She's also the co-director of the Institute uh, for Israel and Jewish Affairs and Jewish Studies, sorry, at Columbia University. Her research, teaching, and publications emerge, engage in the fields of international migration, urban history, uh, Jewish history, American religion, and diaspora studies. Her forthcoming book, A Credit to the Nation, Jewish Immigrant Bankers and American Finance, uh, is forthcoming at Harvard University Press, and it brings together scholarship in Jewish history, American immigration studies, and American economic history. Mm -hmm. Without further ado, I will now turn it over to Professor Birnbaum. Well, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be back here such a long time ago, and uh, in such a 
difficult time, I would say, even add. Um, the question is that this book is dealing with an entire different question. It seems that this book would have been written five or six years ago, and it's uh, completely disconnected to what's going on in the United States. So maybe the question is to know to what degree it is completely disconnected, and maybe we just have to, for to forget the existence of this book. By many aspects, I would argue that it's not the case, because this book is dealing mainly with the Salo Baron idea of the um, lacrimosis theory of history. And the idea, in fact, at the core of this book is to check whether um, Salo Baron point uh, was right or no, can it be contested or not. As you know, probably, Salo Baron argues that uh, Jewish history was not a lacrimose theory of history, that Jews were not persecuted since the Middle Age and so on and so far. So he had hope in the Jewish history. But in fact, after the Eichmann persecution, he changed his point of view and he would say, well, maybe it's still the case. Jews are suffering and all over the world, all over history, but only in the United States there is hope. So he became a kind of uh, lover of the American exceptionalism, a country up to him in which there was no anti-Semitism, a country in which Jews could live their own life in the suburbs, in the local suburbs, in quiet suburbs, far from the state, far from political, far from any involvement in ideological fight, and they could have just a nice life, and they did. So to what degree this new idea of uh, this new issue defended by Salo Baron can still be held nowadays, is there still hope, like Baron would have said long time ago in the United States, is the famous American exceptionalism still working? The idea that Jews are in a good shape in this decentralized, liberal, pluralist society in which they stay far over the state, far over, they, they are, they have no implication with the, within the, the central uh, question of, of, of the state, of, of the, th the central issue of this of the, of the society. By many aspects, it is true. One has to remember only since the beginning of the American Revolution and the Constitution, the fact that Jews enter within society without changing their mind. The, the, the way Jews enter in the United States, I mean, in, within the society, is completely different from the way they enter during the French Revolution, for instance. In France, they had to change their life. They had to change their values. They had to forget their own network, bonds, relation. They should follow a process of regeneration. The crucial concept of the French Revolution was regeneration, I mean complete transformation of the body, of the values, of the spirit, then you could be a citizen. Well, to the country in the United States, Jews were citizens immediately without changing their values, changing their, 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 their relation, their remembrance, and so on and so forth. So there is the core of American exceptionalism, and it's completely different from the French one. I would like to add another question, is the fact that since the, the, the Constitution of 1787, there was, at least at the federal level, a separation between church and state. So Jews could leave their own religion freely, whether in France they had to wait until, let's say, the laws of 1905. When the, when the laïcité was established. Just compare 1905, what's happening in France and what's happening in the United States. 1905, 
Justice David Brower gave his famous speech called The United States as a Christian Nation. This is a crucial speech in the American history. The way that the United States, whatever separation in the Constitution of 1787, is still a, a Christian nation. And as you know, even quite recently, the Supreme Court has to change the obligation to pray, to use the Bible, to follow the Christian dimension of, of, of society. So there is a crucial difference between United States and France in terms of relation between state and religion, state and local life, decentralization, centralization. So Jews could lead another kind of life in the United States, far from the state, and in a, with a certain amount of, of freedom in their own constitution, in the way they, they were organized, at least la, like the old shtetl in another empire. You could compare the empire, the Russian empire, even, there, even if there are strong differences between them, but uh, there was still the possibility of having a life far from the center, far from the, from the state and so on. And by many aspects, the United States is, was a kind of empire also, without the kind of autocratic, despotic regime, but a, a completely decentralized society. It was a dream by many aspects. One has to follow just, for instance, uh, Israel Sangville wrote his famous book in 1908, so three years after the speech given by David Brewer. It means that the melting pot ideas was something, a process through which Jews could melt into the pot. You know? And uh, Sangville was also, in a way, praising the American idea of a society in which Jews could just enter in society without being excluded from this society. In fact, and let me add very quickly the short sentences, things has changed since 1915, up to me, when the lynching of Leo Frank occurred. There is a crucial point here. No Jews, I think, were ever killed in the United States for being Jew since 1905, since 1915. From the beginning until 1915, no Jews were killed. If you compare with France, Russia, Ukraine, wherever, Spain, and so on, Jews were killed during, since so many centuries, everywhere. Jews, no Jews were ever killed. In, for being a Jew as an anti-Semite uh, re uh, reaction. And up to me, the 1915 is a crucial time period where for the first time, one Jew was killed in a very brutal way, as you know, this lynching of uh, Leo Frank in Atlanta meant a lot because in fact, it was related to the kind of first political anti-Semitism, European anti-Semitism. The, the, the mob lynching Frank lynched him as like in Europe, like in Kishinev, if you want. And Kishinev was already present in Jewish memory at that time. You know? Kishinev occurred 10 years ago, 10 years before you now. So there is this kind of transfer from a European anti-Semitism to an American anti-Semitism. And this was this has a long time history. Going through the Jew deal in, during the 30s, during the, to, to, and, and later on, I would say, um, starting again in 1950, 1953, 1958, a, a period during year after year, and this hasn't been really studied, Jews were killed for being Jews. Synagogues were bombs, and uh, Jews were killed, I think, every year 
one can find murder of different Jews. And in fact, the Pittsburgh uh, murder was the largest one, 11 Jews being killed in the, just in one time period. But in fact, this is coming after a long time period where Jews were killed. And why were they killed? That's the crucial argument of the book. They were killed because they were seen as being in charge of the state, in charge of the United States. Because, they, because in, in a way, what I call political antisemitism has joined the United States, has reached the United States. What is political antisemitism? Political antisemitism is different from social antisemitism, from economic antisemitism, from racism antisemitism, from Christian antisemitism. Political antisemitism is just the reaction, the reaction of mobs believing that the state is now in charge in the hands of Jews. And why is it so? Because some Jews made it. They went into the upper level of the state. They got position within the state since the 30s and further on. One can see that Jews have been appointed as ministers, as deputies, and so on and so forth. Then the Jews and the state is seen as being Jewish. And look at the Obama period. If you look at the Obama period, you will see many pamphlets in which Obama is drawn as the, as the puppet of the Jews, as is controlled by the heavy Jews, like in Europe. I mean, the state is now held by the Jews. So this is, at, at the end, this has reached the United States. And just to conclude, let me give you a sentence which proves this. I would like to quote this. I have to find it, I'm sorry. Just leave me one second and I will find it. It's a sentence given by Glenn Miller, 2014, an extremist uh, man who killed several Jews in 2014 in the name of Hitler, in the name of Hitler and of the Nazi ideologies, and what did he wrote in his memories? I'd like to quote just four lines in his memories, which tell you that it might be true that political antisemitism has for the first time reached the United States, which has a lot of consequences for Jews. They are no more outside the state, but they are seen as being inside the state. I'm quoting Glenn Miller, after he killed so many Jews, he, he would say, you were born in bondage to the Jews. Not one of the US Congress, not the president or vice president would be there if he or she had been opposed to the Jews. The Jews intend to exterminate the white Aryan race from the face of the earth. In fact, it is the myth of the Jewish Republic, which has been transferred from France, from Prussia, from Germany, to the United States. And this myth has been lasting for quite a period of time. It would st still be there during the since the election of Donald Trump. Maybe you don't know this, but the first day when De Donald Trump was elected, he was greeted with joy in Washington the first day of the election by anti-Semitic militant of the far right who said, Heil Trump, Heil our people, Heil victory. And since then, through Charlottesville, they would say, Jews will not replace us, it means that political antisemitism, this kind of rightist antisemitism, might be still here. Whatever we believe dealing with the leftist antisemitism, which is now on the spot, which is now so much discussed in the, on the campus, Jews and the left, left and the Jews, antisemitism from the left, antisemitism and Zionism, Gaza, and so on, but in fact, 
you should not forgive, forget that those people are still here and they are still threatening you much more maybe than the other guy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Yes. So thank you, um, Emmanuel. I was so delighted when you invited me. Uh, Maison Francaise is very close to my heart because the donor of my chair, Russell and Bettina Knapp, Bettina was a professor of French literature for over 50 years, um, and the commitment even of her children to both uh, French, the French Jewish experience, and obviously they were committed to understanding American Jewry, because they endowed a chair in American Jewish history, really brings together what we're going to be talking about tonight. And indeed, you know, New York is a wonderful place to talk about the two great first republics of the United States and France, because the Statue of Liberty, as I always emphasize to my students, has nothing to do with immigration. It only has to do with the shared republicanism that France and America shared and felt as, you know, as the present was given to the United States, because this is a book which is about anti-Semitism, but is actually about the liberal state and thinking about what anti-Semitism in today's day and age tells us about the state. So I wanna just, we're divide, there are three main chapters to this book. I am gonna talk about the first two and then Ira is gonna talk about the third and perhaps also the, uh, the other two. Uh, but I wanna first note this is my third conference or event on anti-Semitism since Sunday. I've been at a conference at Penn, JTS, and here. And indeed, it is six months since October 7th. And I think it's important to us just state that we are living in an inflection point in Jewish history. Indeed, assumptions about narratives and concepts concerning Jewish sovereignty, Jewish power, Jewish security, the state, both in Israel but also here. And most importantly for American Jewish historians, and this is where I'm gonna, my first point that I'm gonna put a question to Pierre, I think it has exploded American Jewish exceptionalism. Uh, in the last six months, anti-Semitism has exploded throughout the world and in the United States. And indeed, I think it forced many of us who since 2018, since the Tree of Life massacre have been thinking about how we in the United States, and in particularly in the field of American Jewish history, have been thinking about anti-Semitism. And indeed, um, what this book talks about, and in general, of this notion that while in Europe more people were murdered across time and space, I think does not fully capture, right? The, you know, the narrative of American Jewish exceptionalism is that uh, Amer in America, Jews were granted citizenship right away in 1776, which is not exactly the case, but overall they were. Um, and there's a virtual absence of violent anti-Semitism. Uh, before 2018, the way the general consensus was is that Jews might have confronted prejudice in the United States malevolent behavior. With the exception of Leo Frank, they are rarely right, killed, but they often can also encounter open hostility. But this notion of the absence of deadly violence has made them seen as exceptional and different from their beleaguered co-religionists in Europe. And I would like to argue that just looking around for the past few months, and this is to quote Eric Foner, the history we have been taught could not have produced the present we are living in. And I would like to argue this is, and I should just say, this is my definition of anti-Semitism. I am not speaking for anyone else but myself, okay? Is in the American context, at core, anti-Semitism is the treatment of Jews as unequal, as inferior members of our community, somehow less deserving of the rights we claim that everyone is afforded. And indeed, what this book has raised for me in the first chapter is really deals with historians of Jewish history, and in particular, Baron. And for people who might not know, Baron basically not just 
is the father of Jewish studies at Columbia, but in the United States. He trained the most people. He was given the first chair in Jewish history in 1930. My chair is at the, the Naps are his first cousin. So he intellectually built Jewish studies. He materially built Jewish studies here. And in many ways, what he is talking about, the lachrymose view of Jewish history, is that he was much more invested in thinking about how Jews lived over long periods of time successfully with their neighbors rather than thinking about those few moments of eruptions in which they could not live. So thinking through what causes these eruptions, but thinking more about the long durée of the relative peace, and particularly in the Middle Ages, in which Jews were able to thrive in the communities that they lived. So this book really offers a new interpretive framework through which to understand a chilling rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic violence in the United States, and it gives much food for thought. But indeed, what I enjoyed most about it is its comparative methodological approach in comparing France and the United States. And indeed, I've spent basically my whole career trying to argue that we need a new American Jewish history that looks beyond just the American nation state and has to be thinking more broadly if you actually really want to understand the American Jewish experience. And the second chapter, which I'm going to talk about, so the first chapter is about historians, and primarily it's about Baron. Um, and I will speak for one minute when I have my, at the end, because I have a question for you about that. But the masterful comparison in this book of Dreyfus and Leo Frank is really worth reading for the way in which Berenbaum really interrogates issues of masculinity, gender, race, religion, how they all came together for these two figures in a similar 25-year period, when it was a moment when both the American state and the French state were in a time of, of upheaval. And I think you could have explored more of how that upheaval uh, played out differently in the different places. But it is truly a treasure. And in many ways, it reminded me of what Salo Baron urged American Jewish historians in his 1956 address to the American Jewish Historical Society. He says, quote, they have to realize the impossibility of comprehending any particular territorial evolution in Jewish history without reference to the totality. Indeed, long before comparative or transnational history was in vogue, Baron, like Birnbaum, understood the necessity of seeing the American Jewish experience in a larger framework. So what I want to just now go back, so the, 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 the middle chapter is all about Leo Frank, which is the, the one singular um, outburst of violence against Jews. It's the lynching of uh, Leo Frank in Atlanta for the murder of a young woman who worked in his factory and he is framed. And it is a great interrogation of this episode in American Jewish history. But I want to go back and think about Baron, who basically argued that America is exceptional. And as some historians have argued, uh, particularly Eric Goldstein, he does enormous mental gymnastics to make this. He ignores anti-Semitism. He sees anti-Semitism in America, and he chooses to ignore it. And indeed, it is probably related to he just saw the decimation of European Jewry, and he wants to be convinced that America is not like that because this is where his home is now. But he has shaped a whole approach to understanding America and anti-Semitism. So I would love you, I mean, I've always, uh, when you read through, he has this uh, collection of essays called Steel by Adversity. Baron has a love affair with America, with the United States, which, you know, like love affairs, he does not see the problems, even though he actually writes about some of the problems. And it is an interesting, um, way to be thinking about how it has shaped a field, and indeed why in many ways the approach to understanding the United States since 2018 has been very different by American Jewish historians. Um, I'm trying to think. So I want to just um, 
end with one part, the third chapter that uh, Professor Katznelson is going to talk about more in depth, uh, really talks about the rise of what is political anti-Semitism since, I would say, since Trump's election. Is that since in the 21st century? And indeed, what I would argue is that this is the most powerful and chilling part of the book because it is about thinking about what anti-Semitism says about the state and how polarized politics, weak democracies, often lead to heightened anti-Semitism. And indeed, as Deborah Lipstadt, who visited campus earlier this semester, said, anti-Semitism, and this is her, presents a complex, multifaceted challenge because it is not just about individual well-being, but it is about societal cohesion and the foundations of democracy. And as she ended, what starts with Jews often doesn't end with Jews. So I'm just my question to you is to be thinking about the link, the link between that your first chapter about Baron and how he ignored, I would say consciously, what he was seeing before him in the 1930s in the United States and the present moment in which historians are reevaluating, thinking through anti-Semitism in the state in America and throughout the world. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Ira. Great. Um, mon ami Pierre, this <laughs> is a, a, a great treat and honor for me um, to, uh, to have this chance to comment. Um, my remarks are um, a little jumpy um, because you offer many provocations in this book. Uh, this is a book um, which is not you know, a thick formal history, let alone the 18 volumes of Salo Baron. Um, but you've written many volumes, especially on France. It's, it's a, I would call this the kind of book that is a profound intervention. Um, the kind of intervention that seeks to change the vectors of intellectual and practical conversations. That's what this book is, at least on my reading. I've read it twice. I read it once early because I wrote a blurb for it. And then I I read it again uh, this week to my great, great profit. So don't go anywhere without it. Um, I have questions, um, comments. Um, gewalt, gewalt. <laughs> gewalt, he says. But they, we've been, we know each other nearly a half century. Um, and we've had, I had the great privilege of working with Pierre um, on a subject about which he knows much more than I. Mm -hmm. um, in any event, my questions really fall into a small number of uh, categories, um, one of which concerns the very definition of political anti-Semitism. I don't quarrel at all with the idea that political anti-Semitism, at least one measure of it would be, what you call a kind of mass um, a willingness to assault Jews for their putative position of power in the state. That is how you use the term. You're consistent with it. It's, I don't, not only don't I argue with it, I learn from it. But it seems to me that's not quite sufficient. Um, political anti-Semitism, whether in the case of Dreyfus or in the case of Mayor Lueger, the famous mayor of Vienna who ran on anti-Semitic platforms, or if we look at the post-1879 uh, growth of anti-Semitic leagues and politicians in Austria, Germany, anti-Semitism in France, the great literature of anti-Semitism, uh, and so on, what we see is not just the mob, but we see the elites. We see the leadership of the militaries, of um, the political parties, including mainstream political parties, um, seize on the entry of Jews as a result of political emancipation. Mm -hmm. They seize on that reality. As you rightly, your brilliant work on France reminds us many times, they seize on the entry of Jews in different forms in Austria or Germany or France, uh, 
the Republican tradition is very distinctive in France. But the, however the Jews enter the political um, arena because of the loss of prior political disabilities, there are leading figures, not trivial figures, not peripheral figures as we get, I think, in America, um, but the people who are the equivalent of mayors of the biggest cities or leaders of mainstream political parties who use the Jewish question to mobilize populations and votes at the very moment mass democracy um, was emerging across uh, the center of Europe. Um, so for me, political anti-Semitism is both an elite and a mass matter. You stress the latter, and I want to stress in my remarks the former. Um, second, um, your measure of um, uh, political anti-Semitism, the empirical measure, is very much, and again, I have no quarrel, very much a measure of violence, um, safety. Um, uh, Jews, until Leo Frank, uh, we could argue about whether there was ever a lynching before, as you write about in the book, um, but let's stipulate Leo Frank was the first, uh, may have been the second. Um, the may have been. I learned this from you. Um, so you can't quarrel with me about that. Um, the, um, uh, but first or second, very rare. Um, and certainly, as compared to thousands of African Americans lynched, um, but as compared in your country as well as my country to Italian Americans uh, killed by mobs, uh, or Italians in France killed by mobs. Um, the, the Jewish situation, um, certainly in America, uh, seemed like an entirely safe haven. Um, and, and today we see violence, um, uh, not on a mass scale in the sense of capital M, but on a serious uh, scale. Okay. So I, don't I think violence is, or insecurity physical or otherwise, is an important uh, factor, an important variable. But what is not in the book, I think, I may have missed it. Uh, I mean, there are, there are references to uh, um, Madison Grant and other racists who want to restrict immigration. But basically, I think the immigration membership issue um, uh, was an important elite as well as mass issue. Um, uh, the question of who is eligible to come to America, and it, well before Franklin Roosevelt is elected president, not much before, but uh, a decade before, 1921 and 1924, the gate closed on Jews. Um, this, I believe, to have been, in, as the Aliens Act in 1905 in Britain was, a, a form of... Uh, certainly of anti-Jewish, explicitly anti-Jewish sensibility, also anti-Catholic, by the way, um, uh, but also but anti-Semitic. Um, so you have a form of political anti-Semitism about membership um, in the United States before the, the moment you, you highlight of the Jews entering the state mm -hmm. in large numbers. So I'm... The, it's in part a question, in part an observation, which is to say, um, it's my first point, I think the central concept of political anti-Semitism, to my preference, would have both an elite as well as a mass dimension, and would have a membership as well as violence dimension, at least a, a kind of two-by-two two, um, uh, uh, table. Then where is America in this story, and, and when? Um, and, of course, this is a complex question, and you treat it with uh, great sensibility and sensitivity and thoughtfulness. Um, first, I would say that in the United States, um, the social, economic, cultural, and theological anti-Jewish sensibilities were no lower in, say, at the end of the 19th or early 20th centuries than they were in Austria, or Germany, or France. Um, 
they, uh, what was different, what was different was the absence of elite political anti-Semitism. Um, uh, at just the moment, in, you mentioned 1905 as a pivotal year, and you mention in your book the celebration Jews had of um, a quarter millennium since they'd arrived in New Amsterdam. Um, the, uh, in 1905, uh, 5,000 people crammed into Carnegie Hall to celebrate this uh, millennium. And who was there? Grover Cleveland, former president of the United States, the governor of New York, the mayor of New York, the head of the Episcopal Church, uh, which was a political position as well as a religious one in New York City uh, and the like. At the very moment that in Vienna, Lueger, whom I mentioned, is the mayor of the city. The two cities, New York and Vienna, were both cosmopolitan. They were both cities of immigrants at the time. They had roughly the same proportion of Jews. In one, you have political anti-Semitism. In one, not. This is elite anti-Semitism. I think what Jews had at this moment, because of the relative absence of um, elite anti-Semitism, was, uh, there also was a letter, by the way, to the Carnegie Hall gathering from President Theodore Roosevelt, saluting the Jews as uh, the Jewish nation as part of the American nation, et cetera, et cetera. What Jews achieved in America was not free of anti-Semitism. What they achieved was what I would call, would call, not in any original way, optimal marginality. Um, uh, marginal because it's a Christian country. Um, it's a country from which you could not be admitted uh, to a professorship in the history department if you were Jewish in 1905 in the, here. You could be admitted in Vienna or, or in Berlin with difficulty, but there were some. Oh, very few. Very few, very but few. none. Here, none, no. zero at Columbia. Um, uh, almost none in, in, in Germany. Almost no, that's, to be fair, that's true. In, if you go to the 1920s in Weimar, Germany, it's, a it's different. It changed. Weimar is different. Yes, bien sûr. Um, but the, um, uh, be that as it might take two more minutes. The, the, um, uh, what Jews did have was a sense of physical security, which you, you stress, and the opportunity to enter into sub-parts of the economy, um, not all, not to the banks, not to the white shoe law firms, but they could enter into uh, various parts of uh, small manufacturing, cigar industry, you could go on textiles um, and, and the like. Jews could worship freely without interruption. There were no pogroms. Uh, but most important, no major politician mobilized against Jews. Okay. Now, my question uh, for today, jumping well ahead, is do Jews continue to have optimal marginality? Um, uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know the answer. I'm not as confident as you are that the moment of political mass political anti-Semitism has occurred. I'd make two points, and then I'll stop. Um, one has to do with uh, an era which I have worked on, the Roosevelt uh, period and after. Um, yes, you're quite right. Roosevelt opened the doors to, um, uh, he closed, he didn't open the doors to immigrants. Um, uh, it, it, their political anti-Semitism really reigned in America. Um, uh, uh, and I'm very, in the literature on, uh, you know, what Roosevelt could or should have done in the 1930s, I'm on the hypercritical side. Um, uh, uh, but be that as it may, the, the, but he did open the door to Jews in political life uh, in many, many, many ways. Um, but mass anti-Semitism in the 1930s was rife, as you point out. Father Coughlin had 30 million listeners on the radio every week. Uh, almost a quarter of the American population listened to this anti-Semitic ranting um, uh, weekly. And yet, Franklin Roosevelt, who was a mass and popular politician, nonetheless protects and pursues a, a, a Jewish protection 
even more, one little story. Um, when Irving Berlin writes the song, uh, God Bless America, um, which I won't sing. Um, uh, you should, you should. Yeah, um, uh, which becomes a second national anthem in a, in a way. Um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt invites Kate Smith, the singer, to come and do it at the White House and says, this is America. Um, uh, this Jewish immigrant boy's song could not happen in most of Europe. Um, uh, Jews did have optimal. And then after the war, what we do know is that be the, the war against fascism created a circumstance in which mass anti-Semitism was, didn't, didn't disappear privately, but disappeared publicly to a very great extent as compared to the 1930s. Um, uh, it became un-American to be anti-Semitic. Um, this is not quite true. Th there are aspects of the McCarthyite anti-communist thing, which were deeply Jewish. Uh, uh, there was the Oppenheimer question. Uh, I, I don't mean to, to minimize any of that. But it was until the tree of life, as it were, it was perfectly reasonable for Jews and for Salo Baron to think that uh, a very special haven of optimal marginality existed. I, I, I want to end with two, two empirical facts, um, uh, which are in, in effect a form of question. Felix Frankfurter, who plays an important role in your book. Um, in the book, uh, Pierre says, rightly, that Frankfurter became a symbol uh, for the anti-Semites of what's wrong with the Roosevelt administration, right? I mean, you. You stress how Frankfurter was the emblem of Jewish control of politics. Frankfurter was nominated to the Supreme Court by Franklin Roosevelt. He was approved on a unanimous vote. Not one politician uh, gave expression to political anti-Semitism, whereas the mass in the 1930s was full of the kind of political anti-Semitism. Second fact. And I never say a nice word, or I rarely say a nice word. This isn't meant to be a nice word about Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> but, but I'll end with this. And it's a form of a question. I will read some names. I have to change my glasses to read these names. Um, Elliot Abrams, Steve Mnuchin, Stephen Miller, Gary Cohn, Reed Cordish, Rod Rosenstein, Ellen Carr, Jeffrey Rosen, David Shulkin, Lawrence Kudlow, John Eisenberg, uh, Ezra Cohn Watnick. Uh, I read 12 out of 20 of the Jews at the top of the Trump administration. How do the whites, what's the link, and this is my last question, between the mass um, white supremacist violent, ugly anti-Semitism, and the person they adore, um, they celebrate, and, he, and yet has a willingness to make the Secretary of Treasury once again, uh, not just Jack Lew in the Obama administration, but Mnuchin in the Trump administration, or a leading specialists in foreign affairs, or the Secretary of Transportation, or, or, or. Um, Jews, are, uh, continue to have, even in the ugliest administration we've ever had in American history in terms of the, the standing of anti-Semites and the approval of anti-Semitism, with a wink and implicitly, um, mm. still have um, broadly safe haven and optimal marginality. So thank you. No. <laughs> well, it's now a difficult question in a way, and um, I might not be able to answer most of them. Um, to you first, um, there is this, as you mentioned, this interesting uh, parallel between the Leo Franck and the Dreyfus affair, which occur more or less at the same time period. But in fact, Dreyfus was seen as being innocent in 1906 already. And he was, at the end, 
being seen as being innocent, whether Frank didn't. Even nowadays, I think Frank hasn't really been considered as being innocent, even nowadays. So there are strong differences between those two prosecutions and the state in France. The strong Republican state had been able to fight against the, the anti-Semitic anti mobilization and the Cour Suprême, the Cour de Cassation, the French state has been able to say at the end that he was innocent. In fact, there was something quite different I would have liked to mention. It's the fact that Watson himself, and I think I, I, I mentioned it in the book, that Watson himself was conscious of what, happening, what was happening in France, but everything he said was wrong. Yeah. Every, every fact he mentioned dealing with the French, the affair de refuse, everything is wrong. So, um, Baron, that's a difficult question. Maybe I should just answer that by the fact that Baron was not interested by politics. As you know much better than I, Baron was an economist, Baron was deeply concerned by economy and not at all by, by politics. So, it, I think he never wrote anything really on anti-Semitism in the United States. I found two articles, two small articles in collective books, which are extremely dull. There is nothing in it. And uh, there is no political consideration, nothing, really. You know those two, two, two mm -hmm. small articles. But so. They weren't scholarly, they were popular. I'm well, sorry? One was popular. It was a popular article. Right, yeah. yeah. So I didn't really answer your question, but um, the fact that he was mainly interested by, by, by the economy, in fact, he was an economist much more than, he, he never wrote anything really, he never paid attention to politics as such in Europe or wherever, in which country. Ira, as always, and like you, so uh, knocking like in a box, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I am dead already. Mm -hmm. I'm unable to answer anything. But let me try, nevertheless, to <laughs> add some small points. Um, well, you got some good points, I would say. Um, the, the easiest way to answer your first question on mob versus elite would be to say very easily that if the elite didn't mobilize, or when a political elite is entering in the anti-Semitic process, it is mainly because it might be itself threatened by the way that the fact Jews are entering in the state. They are taking their own position they are occupying the state instead of us. We Christian, we Christian, we don't want them to take our position. So in a way, we can relate the two questions. I don't know, yeah. we can relate in a way the, those dimensions, which was a fact in France, for instance, what I call la, la République juive, the Jewish Republic, the myth of the Jewish Republic, was in fact like, like during the Weimar Republic. There was no political anti-Semitism, no strong political anti-Semitism in Germany, in Prussia, because there was no Jew, very few Jew, almost none, in the highest level of the administration. But the very fact when they are able to enter in the state during the Weimar Republic, immediately we witness a strong political anti-Semitism and the death of uh, Stressman. Yes. Immediately he's killed. Whether Leon Blum was not killed. You see the difference also. The guy, for the first time, a Jew has been appointed as foreign minister, a very high position during the Weimar. Immediately he's killed. Whether Leon Blum is not the, even the first who got this kind of position, and he was not killed. He remained in power, and furthermore, he went back in power three times. He was even, uh, uh, the president, you could say, even after the war. So, you see the difference between, I think there is a point there, but it's not a strong point. 
it's a minor point, but uh, I'm trying what I can, you know, really. <laughs> so, yes, uh, Italians in the United States are, or, or Irish are much more killed than Jews, obviously. Yes, but we know that. What we didn't know, we didn't pay enough attention to the fact that Jews were never killed. Now, they are being killed. So, it, it's, yes, they were never killed as Italians or Irish. Yes, or, or, or black. I don't know how you say black people. Or I don't know how you say. You should say now in, in the United States, African-American or whatever. No one is listening to me, so I'm not going to be in jail. So, uh, but, but there is a start of something. And Pittsburgh is more than the start. Pittsburgh, it's, it's a turmoil, really. Pittsburgh, it's something unbelievable. And Jews were looking at Pittsburgh as if it was Kishinev. If you look at P the way people react when, when Pittsburgh occurred, was not to relate to the Shoah. Shoah is something in the movie, it's far away, it's Europe. But Pittsburgh was seen as being a pogrom, like it is the case nowadays again. You know. uh, the pogrom, the myth, of the, 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 the memory of the pogrom has been transferred from one generation to another through immigration, the Jewish immigrations, beginning of turning of the 19th, 20th century, the end of the 19th, 19, 1890, 1895, to 12th 12, 12 and beginning of the 20th century. And in fact, they came here with, with Kishinev in their head, in their mind. And they transferred Kishinev to their son and the, and the children, and the children transfer Kishinev. Kishinev is still something which matters in Jewish remembrance. And Pittsburgh was seen as being Kishinev. I was, I was amazed when you look at the reaction of Jews. They, they, Kishinev has joined us. They, they mention it. So the last point, I'm not going to deal it at all because it's, I'm weak there. I cannot find an argument. So uh, it's a very interesting question. Why Frankfurter? being so uh, strongly attacked as being the Jew in charge of the Republic. He was seen as, as being the Jews in charge, but not, and Morgenthau and all the other. And I would even add another argument against me, giving you another argument. Why so many Jews have been appointed during the Biden cabinet? There are even more Jews in the Biden cabinet, much more. For the first time in American history, much more than the Jews you mentioned in Trump, yes. which doesn't hold the main secretary position, the one you'd mentioned, few of them. If you look at the Biden cabinet, they are, most of them are Jews. The highest position, treasury, finance, even the CIA, I guess, the, 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 uh, the foreign minister, most of them, of the crucial highest position as Secretary of State, not just within a, an institution somewhere, but Secretary of State. I think it's the first time in American history. Kissinger. One, but now we've got 10, oh, no, I, 15 I in terms of quantity, yeah. quantitative data. It's amazing. So many. And no reaction. So it's, a, it's, 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 it's even an argument against me, but even stronger. Yeah. So we have to witness whether tomorrow or in the next few days, the next few months, this kind of political anti-Semitism will occur or not. And it might occur. No one has done the research. I've done a little bit of the research before you know, and during the Obama research, um, cabinet or presidency. But I, I, I really would like someone it's a good subject for a PhD or a master's degree. To what degree a, a new kind of political sentiment will arise, or is, is already there, but has, hasn't been really researched in the extreme right against Biden, seen as being the puppet of the Jews, and even more, the fact that he's helping so much Israel and 
telling everyone everywhere that I am a Jew, I am, his, I am, a, I am a Zionist. He says so many times uh, that this kind of political antisemitism might occur today or tomorrow also. I've done what I can, really. So does I, thank you so much for these clarifications. Does either of you want to respond to the response? Uh, otherwise, I have a question before opening it up to, uh, to, to questions. Can I, I have a response to Ira and to Pierre. Just the, my question is about the scale and frameworks through which we view anti-Semitism. And it seems like violence, the ballot box, and Jews holding positions of power are a way we're evaluating it. But I'm taking up what you're saying about mobs and elites. Can you at the same time have someone who puts Jews in places of power and amplifies anti-Semitism? Yes. And we that's, and we, we had one, that's right, we had one. So I think in some ways, the ways in which we evaluate and differentiate anti-Semitism is really important because I think we don't have the scales and the frameworks because people will say, you know, X person put this, per, you know, that, that is what I, I think, what I would say troubled about the end of the book the most is that is violence the barometer by which we, val we evaluate anti-Semitism, right? When there's violence, there's real anti-Semitism. And without violence, well, you know, it's social anti-Semitism and no one really takes that seriously. Jews not being in clubs or whatever, but- It's not too bad. Right, but I'm just, I'm, I think that that is a framework we have to interrogate, mm -hmm. right? Because that is just one form. And, and I think that that is what, you know, has become very evident since 2016. And there is also a connection yeah. between the two levels of anti-Semitism. I mean, what we've seen also after the election of Trump is a, a feeling that some sentiments are now uh, allowed to be expressed. Um, whereas that wasn't necessarily the case before. Okay, um, I'd like to open it up to um, the audience. Uh, we have a question here, the gentleman at the back, and then uh, the lady here in white. Raise some issues that weren't raised in your discussion, and that is the impact of Kishinev on black Jewish relations in the United States. Because we know that those who backed the NAACP, the formation of it, were influenced by Kishinev. And that raises a whole separate issue about black Jewish relations throughout the 20th century to the present. Secondly, the militia movement. I covered the militia movement for two years as a journalist. I would start with the bombing at Oklahoma, which was against the Zionist it's occupation. It's in the book, it's in the book. It's in the book. I find it a little uh, disingenuous to start with 2018 because the people motivated to do that Anybody who reads about Christian identity, religion, is quite clear that this is a derivation of even a wider phenomena going on since the election of Goldwater. And finally, how do we understand and deal with the situation now? We just had four students expulsed from this uh, university because they put on a uh, teaching about Hamas uh, that, uh, and I think about those of us with gray hair who might have done these things 50 years ago with the NLF in Vietnam or with the anti-apartheid movement backing the ANC, where do we draw the line and where does one have to make distinctions between, quote, anti-Semitism versus anti-Zionism or whatnot? Thank you. Great, we'll take maybe another question. Um, there was uh, the lady here in white. That's Vicky. Yeah. Uh, Vicky. Sort of puzzled by, by the term Political anti-Semitism. I, I think that the questions, you know, that, that, that you know, originally, in some ways, Pulzer's book. It was a classic, and almost immediately there were questions. Well, then, what do you do about the racial anti-Semitism? I mean, it seemed what you seem to be doing is using it as, you know, a stage. Okay, that but prior to um, you know what you've seen happening um, uh, now, the future. So we might go from political anti-Semitism then to some other racial, ra highly racialized uh, anti-Semitism. So I guess I was wondering about what other, God forbid to use the word categories here, but for example, Nuremberg. 
I mean, the, his di distinction between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, I found that very interesting, I mm -hmm. suppose, because the anti-Judaism captured the constant play with Christianity. And that seems to be a highly determining Issue in the United States, this bound, this this creation of this bound, of, of of this of this link between this create you know inflated Christianity, this afflatus, and you know the materialist Jew, even without identifying the Jew, because you know it's a there's so there's so many possible Jews. Okay, so I, I would like to hear whether that is an, could be another way, because the, what it does is allow you then to deal with numbers of contingencies, as, you know, Great Britain, I, I understand the need for, to draw parallels or, or you know, create uh, comparative structures, the state in France, the state here, but then all of those sort of ill-formed states like Great Britain or Latin America, where you could say, hey, you know, Jews have done pretty well, no pogroms. I'm not mistaken anyway. There, there's a, a different ways of living so that the transatlantic comparison may not only be working. Finally, the categorization of that violence, of, of, of the, you, said, you call it a pogrom, but you know, across the United States, you thought that church synagogue killing, hey, it's like all the other killings of an immense violent society whose violence you know, you ha one has to analyze to, to be able to capture the specificity. Is that a pogrom or is that just one more church being taken down or one more kindergarten being taken down? In other words, you can take the violence across and you can see infinite numbers of kind of workings out of why you, know, you should be targeting basically defenseless people, humans. Uh, whether they're Jews, children, and so on and so forth. Thank you so much. So, um, Professor Bierbaum, do you want to take the first two questions, or or we can spread it as well? Um, well, maybe maybe I should, should try to answer to. Uh, well, Oklahoma is in the book, and uh, there is a description of what was happening during this um, event. I don't have any really um, any kind of answer to the other point you mentioned, but you are right. The the Kishinev remembrance was important also. With I don't know how I should say I should say the, the black community, the black African America, and uh, our friend uh, Zipperstein wrote a book uh, some years ago on Kishinev, in which he mentioned the way uh, the black American saw themselves as um, the victims of pogroms like the Kishinev. And the, he, 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 he found many quite interesting uh, quotation in the, in the news, in the press, in the, in the newspaper of the black community in the United States, how Kishinev was uh, impressed them. And, it, it's a very interesting point you, you, you mentioned. Uh, Victoria, I would like to answer your question in a very funny way. I'm unable to answer the, the question itself, so I would like to ask you my question. I start reading your brilliant book. It's, it's an amazing book. And Italy could be seen as, a con as something which contradicts my interpretation because Jews were able to enter in the Piedmont state. And as you know much more than I, Piedmont has built Italy. But Jew, you could find at the end of the 19th century Jews, ministers, generals, and so on and so forth. And my question to you would be, was there any political anti-Semitism in Italy? I don't think so. How could you explain this? That's the kind of reaction. The kind of, this kind of reaction that we can find in France and maybe in the United States or, in the, or, or, or during the Weimar Republic, I don't think it did exist in modern Italy, but you know this much better than I. Well, yeah, I mean, in some sense, Italians were the validators in Soviet in general from this to come back. Right. 
There are generals and so on. Yes. Yes. Race laws. Yes. There were too many of them. But. But. Right. Right. It's quite different, yeah. I would like to jump from one point to another and to mention before the end of this discussion two articles which are quote in my lecture, which are amazing. There is one which has been quote everywhere in the United States. Very recent article by in the Atlantic. I, I'm sure you, you read this paper by Frank, Franklin Fowler, and what he says is it's it's, a, it's terrifying, and it's going on the same kind of argument that I that I did that I had. Let me quote him. This article has been reviewed everywhere. It's been read everywhere, and he said, quotation. The golden age of American Jewry has given way to a golden age of conspiracy, reckless, hyperbole, and polit political violence, all tendencies inimical to democratic temperament, extremist thought, extremist thought, and mob behavior have never been good for Jews. And what's bad for Jews, it can be argued, is bad for America. And I would like to quote another article which was published recently by Tablet Magazine. It's a very recent one, March 1st, by Jacob Sovich, which was just a month ago. And he would publish an article which is called The Vanishing. The Vanishing. The is erasure. Erasure? Mm -hmm. The erasure of Jews from American life, and he would say, he would go so far to say, quotation, Jews had been purged. Can you understand the word purge? Yes, yeah. it's strong. Yeah. Jews has been purged from liberal institution, mentioning movies, university, mass media, and so on, and so, museum and so far and so away. So it's, it, it, we are really witnessing a crucial moment, a kind of turmoil within the American society. I don't know. I'd like to go through one last round of questions. Um, so uh, is the gentleman at the back. Thank you. Um, I'll be quick. A couple comments and a question um, regarding Kishinev and the um, African-American uh, um, sort of alignment. Um, it makes me think of, of Tulsa, and which was a program against you know African American in their own right, and uh, in a way, sort of linked you know the Kishinev programs with the African American condition in the United States. Just a food for thought. Uh, regarding uh, Trump uh, appointing a, a lot of uh, Jewish. Um, cabinet members, um, it's, um, there are different ways to look at it. Um, I would offer one which is that it's purely transactional and that it's also, uh, it, it, in, it incorporates uh, the, um, the evangelical uh, notion of, uh, you know, voting for Trump uh, is also voting for, you know, this, you know Israel. And uh, my question would be uh, regarding the Mallorca's uh, impeachment. Uh, as we all know, there's an impeachment going on right now, uh, as a matter of fact, against the, uh, the Homeland uh, Security uh, Secretary, who is Jewish uh, from uh, uh, 
Havana and and furthermore beyond that, uh, you know, Central Europe. Um, and it's not the the fact that there's an impeached uh, secretary that is at issue. It's all the language around it, using um, you know the big replacement theory that the Democrats want to flood the United States with immigrants uh, to replace the uh, Republican vote. So my question is, is that the premise, or do you see this as maybe the beginning of an elite, um, a Republican elite, um, starting to use these type of messages uh, against Jews? Well, as you know, when during Charlottesville, the main uh, songs, the main uh, uh, cry, the, the, the way people express themselves was using the French expression of you will not replace us, the grand remplacement. So again, you've got the myth of the French Repub the, the Jewish Republic. Which, was, which is in Renaud Camus' book, you know. And uh, Renaud Camus is really belo belongs really to the extreme right and belongs to this long-term streams from Drummond up to nowadays. And the fact that people in the United States know something about Renaud Camus, which is someone, you know, you don't even pay attention to him. But they knew that Renaud Camus said so, and they were using the... Slogan, would you say slogan? Jews will not replace us, you know. Who is us? And it's, so it, it does fit with my main argument, I don't know. Thank you. Perhaps time for one last question. I think you had your hand Yeah, um, so I, I actually lived in Chisinau and, and uh, in other parts of the world, and th this experience in the last, I guess it's been six months, is probably the most dangerous and most strange and bizarre with the strange, vicious cognitive dissonance that seems to pervade in many parts of our society, including universities, unfortunately. And the right wing is also taken advantage of if you study that. So it seems like hate is, it's hard to figure out if it's left or right, it's hate. And, if, and many of my friends have said, you know, we only have about two, 20 years left as Jews to live healthily and safely in the United States. What, what do you say if someone were to posit that like my friend did? I didn't see the point. I'm sorry. I didn't understand what you're asking, really. He, he's asking if it's the end of the golden age, that yeah. Jews only have 20 years left. That's what yeah. you... Yeah. There's so much hate on all, all sides. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Gewalt. <laughs> Gewalt. I'm sorry. Gewalt, you know. We should worry about that, you know. We should be conscious of what's going on. How... How can we react? How can Jews defend themselves? And it's not easy, and um, it's very worrying, really, really. Same in France and everywhere. Um, it's a turn more. It's an earth shake. You know? It's a it's a crucial period, I would say, in the Jewish history. People will remember later on what the Crusade. Uh, Dreyfus, maybe the Shoah and the 7th Oct October 7. You know. I, I think it's a point of inflection. That's what I was trying to say. We are questioning all our assumptions. And that is, in Israel, all the assumptions about Jewish sovereignty was that something like October 7th could never happen when yeah. Jews had their own state. Mm -hmm. So it is going to take a long time to unpack that. And in the United States, I, I don't ever, I'm a historian, I don't ever do the future. But um, you should, you should. I should, right? I don't, I would never say X 20 years something is going to happen, but I would just like to give, Pierre is going to speak again in two days. This I can say for sure at the Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies. So if you want to ask more, I'm just, I'm just, and Ira, I know you want Ira to answer if you think that 20 more years, but I should also say Franklin Floor is speaking here to, at, um, at Kraft tomorrow. Really? Tomorrow? Yes. When? Where? I think he's speaking at Kraft tomorrow. I don't know. I have to look it up in my computer, but and I don't know. At, at, the, at the Hillel. At the Hillel. At the Hillel. Yeah. But I just, Ira, your Do you want the future last predictions word? of Jews in the United States. <laughs> First of all, every, everyone, read this book. Um, <laughs> uh, second, um, I, 
I want to advertise one more book by my dear friend Pierre. Your your brilliant book on Land Bloom um, uh, is really um, uncommonly uh, penetrating, and uh, it's also a short book, um, uh, uh, but it's um, it raises the kinds of questions <coughs> you raise here, but through the French lens of this uh, Jewish leader. Um, what, what's happening to you? You are too kind with me today. Yeah. <laughs> However, <laughs> no. but, but the um, uh, two final things for me. Uh, first, on the present moment, I wish I knew where we are. Um, uh, I, I'm not ready yet to draw the worst conclusions, um, but I'm not willing to live with a kind of optimism. simple optimism. Uh, things will work out. Uh, we don't know. Um, uh, the, whether the, there's a kind of um, spasm of violence, which is not just, as, as Professor de Grazia said, uh, not just uh, uh, limited to this population, but has been a, uh, it's a form of, of uh, danger and sickness in American society more broadly right now. And the forms of mobilization that uh, Donald Trump uses, you just watch any of his rallies, um, is completely out of the, what was nothing like that ever before in the mainstream of American politics. If he were, God help us, to be elected, um, there will be an extraordinary moment of truth. Um, uh, and it will come because he promises at every rally to pardon the people who were in prison, some of them for 10, 15, 20 years for January 6th, um, the assault on Congress. Um, uh, the Proud Boys and others have been put in prison. Um, the American system did hold um, uh, in this respect. And um, we now have a man who says, oh, these are patriots. Um, uh, if he is president of the United States and follows through on the pardon for people who had racist shirts, anti-Jewish slogans, Auschwitz not enough, you know, this kind of thing, would be um, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, moment whose consequences I do not know what they would be. Finally, um, I do think um, there was one aspect which was in the colloquy that Pierre, you and uh, Vicky had, um, which I think is where I would underscore, um, uh, namely that when the very term anti-Semitism, not just anti-Judaism, not just Christian anti-Judaism, but the modern term anti-Semitism was invented, of course, in the 1870s, um, it was immediately tied to eugenics and to racism. Um, and um, so conversion, which was a kind of solution available earlier, no longer is available. Um, and what you see in the American ultra alt-right is, is this combination of resentment against Jews in the state and their racial distinctiveness. So the power comes not just from the political refusal, but from the racial dynamic. And we've seen over a century just, or more, just how dangerous that combination can be. Uh, so the question for me about the future is whether political leadership, which to date, uh, even, even the worst of, of the leaders, has not seized political anti-Semitism. But if we have these pardons and so on, in effect, it will be a formal recognition of racial political anti-Semitism and anti-black racism and other forms as well. And this is a challenge. Um, I, I don't think, finally, that we could talk endlessly about this. I don't think it's right to call the 19th century America. It's a weak state in the French sense, but it's a very strong state from, from other senses. Um, a state that can capture a continent, a state that can have stable institutions of a kind France could not achieve um, for a whole century, the 19th century. Um, a state that had an appealing 
liberal, political liberal story about itself that could be reproduced. Um, that combination of um, a plural, liberal, decentralized, strong state, in my view, um, weak by French comparison, a capable state, um, a protective state, um, is the one that could well come at risk, um, as you profoundly put it in this book. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for a very enlightening discussion.